Good afternoon, everybody. This is Jules Nedlin from the Drug Policy Alliance. I want to thank you all for joining us this afternoon for our Drug Researchers Roundtable. Um, first of all, let me just extend our well wishes and hope that everybody is staying uh, healthy and safe uh, and that all your loved ones are also healthy and safe. You know, these are really challenging times and we appreciate your being with us here today. I want to thank uh, Summer, uh, the intern who's helped organize these, my staff, Sheila and Eliza, who are on the line, uh, and uh, Carolyn, our speaker today, who have uh, been incredibly flexible in moving this to an online uh, forum. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, I just wanted to take a minute to uh, introduce DPA and my department to those of you who may not be familiar with us. Uh, the Drug Policy Alliance is a national organization working to end the war on drugs. We uh, work to change policy at both the state and federal level, trying to move uh, how we respond to drug use from a criminal justice approach to one rooted in public health, science, uh, and compassion. Uh, the Department of Research and Academic Engagement, which I oversee, and um, Sheila Summer and um, Aliza uh, help staff, uh, works to bridge the divide between research and policy within the field of, of drug policy. We do that through a number of, of programs and means to do that, but one of the things we try to do is put researchers in direct conversation with policymakers, providers, and advocates uh, so that the research that they're doing can get out in the world and really impact policy and make a difference in the lives of the people that we care about. So this is, like I said, a, a part of our monthly series. It's generally held uh, the last Thursday of the month. Um, and we uh, will be uh, hosting events in, in April um, in the upcoming months, probably online as the continuing COVID situation evolves, but we'll certainly keep you apprised of that. But this afternoon, it's my very great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Caroline Parker, who is a postdoctoral fellow in medical anthropology at the University of Manchester. Her primary research interests are in addiction, therapeutics, neoliberalism, and the carceral state. She has published widely in journals of social science and public health, including the New England Journal of Medicine, Culture, Medicine, Psychiatry, and Medical Anthropology Quarterly. And so uh, coming to you live from the UK, uh, without further ado, I give it, I give it over to uh, Carolyn. Thanks, Carolyn, for being here. Thank you, Jules. Um, yeah, and just thank you, everybody, for taking the time to log in today. I'm sure you will have many other things occupying your minds right now. Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, and thank you, Jules and everybody at DPA, um, for keeping this train moving. <laughs> um, so today, um, I'm going to be talking about my ongoing book project, um, which is uh, unfinished. I'm still writing it, um, but its title is Carceral Livelihoods in Puerto Rico. And this is all based on um, research that I first started in 2016. And so the events described in the book take place in institutions known as therapeutic communities. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of these. Um, they're essentially mutual aid-based residential drug treatment programs. They have various different names. Um, and so you might be aware that for some time now, there's been a kind of debate among researchers about the extent to which these organizations and approaches um, are effective in achieving kind of positive health and social outcomes. So carceral livelihoods, I should just say, it isn't an attempt to quantify or evaluate therapeutic communities and their public health outcomes. Instead, um, what the book looks at is it examines ethnographically the role that these organizations have come to play in generating legal job opportunities in post-industrial Puerto Rico. So to that end, it follows the lives of a group of male residents who I first got to know in 2015 and who I've continued to follow since then. These men, for the most part, have spent years of their lives working and living in therapeutic communities. Um, they've often lived full time on site um, for many years at a time. Um, most of these men will have at some point worked in the drug economy. Um, most of them have criminal records for drug related offenses and many have spent time in prison at some point. And so what this study basically seeks to capture is kind of how the men who come through these programs are devising ways of working and living within this therapeutic community system 
And I think one of the kind of major questions I'm interested in here is how the carceral turn or um, the war on drugs kind of since the late 20th century has ignited um, new ways of living and new ways of working and what these look like um, kind of on the ground. Um, so just in terms of a roadmap for today's talk, um, I'm going to spend about 10 minutes talking about my site and methods and then another 10 talking about the historical context in which these organizations have taken shape in Puerto Rico, um, looking a bit more closely at the kind of specific history of Puerto Rico's carceral turn. And in the second half of the talk, I'm going to delve a little more deeply into a kind of abridged version of a chapter, which I'm hoping will give us more of a kind of close up sense of what it's like to work in one of these places. Um, the chapter I've chosen to focus on today is called Carceral Adjuncting. And it focuses on the program graduates who have assumed positions of responsibility at therapeutic communities. Um, so this chapter won't really deal with the people who are entrusted to these institutions care, the residents, um, but I do look at that in other parts of the book and I'm happily talk about that in the discussion. Um, so just before I get into the book's major arguments, I want to say a quick note on language. Um, so some of the terms on the board um, or the screen, if you can see, they might be a bit jarring. Um, as you can see, in this kind of hierarchical structure, residents often identify as addicts and with those who completed the program often calling themselves re-educated ex-addicts. Um, and I know that um, for many people, they've kind of abandoned these terms um, out of concerns that they are stigmatizing. Um, in other places, they remain sources of personal identity. And so in this presentation, I'm basically kind of preserving the language that is used by the people in the organizations um, that I'm describing and the people that I interviewed. Um, and I'm gonna come back to this slide um, in a sec. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of try and tell you what my argument in the book kind of is upfront um, so we can have that in mind. Um, so in terms of the thrust of the book, um, when we look at social science perspectives on mass incarceration and the war on drugs, I think one of our most important frameworks for understanding carceral expansion, carceral expansion, sorry, um, it is this notion of punishing the poor. And so I think there's a broad enough consensus here among sociologists, anthropologists, criminologists, and others, but one influential voice in this debate is a sociologist called Loic Wacom, who famously argued um, that carceral expansion um, during the latter half of the 20th century um, basically constituted a penalization of poverty. And so uh, by penalization of poverty, what he was getting at was this idea that the increasing of carceral uh, populations, so you know, people who are either incarcerated or held in prisons or under some other form of criminal justice surveillance, such as probation or parole, um, is due to basically the growing use of the criminal justice system as an instrument for managing poverty. So in other words, what he was saying is that what is happening in the United States and other places in the global north is that neoliberal policies, things like economic deregulation, social welfare retrenchment, kind of are creating a whole host of problems at the bottom of the social class structure. And so the argument goes, our governments are now using the criminal justice system to kind of contain and squash the problems that are created by these same neoliberal policies. Um, and so if we kind of use, uh, think through uh, this kind of penalization of poverty idea, um, I think, you know, it, it invites us to kind of understand therapeutic communities as this kind of straightforward extension of the carceral state for containing criminalized men who've been expelled in some sense from the civic social order. Um, and I don't want to dive too deeply into social science theory right now. Um, but um, I think just for those of you who are interested, I think, you know, uh, moving away from these kind of analytics of um, the human warehouse or containment or Saski Assassin's notion of expulsion, expulsion um, these, these ideas that kind of focus on what the state does um, and what actions the state does and what policies it has. Um, I'm kind of trying to say like this is really important work, but it doesn't have so much to say about the experiences and lives and agency of people who are really impacted um, by mass incarceration and by the carceral turn and by the war on drugs. 
And so kind of one of the big social sciences questions I'm interested in in this book is about people's capacity for agency, um, especially in spaces where agency seems to not exist. And so how, how do men who are kind of caught up in the carceral turn attempt to repurpose the containment into an alternative way of living? And I guess um, what immediately struck me when I began field work for this book uh, was the extent to which the men who live and work in these communities, um, you know, who have very much been the targets of these carceral interventions, um, have really striven to take advantage of the opportunities available to them and have essentially managed to build lives and careers for themselves within these organizations. And so kind of having spent several years going back to these therapeutic communities, I've come to conceive of them and the efforts of their inhabitants in terms of carceral livelihoods. And this is kind of a construct I'm using to capture um, like what I see to be a, a blending of a way and living and a way of working that is taking shape in these carceral spaces. And, and in case you're wondering what, you know, what do I mean by carceral, um, so just briefly, I think, um, sorry, it's like really hard to tell because I can't see who, who, I, who I'm talking to. So sorry if this is stuff you already know. Um, but the carceral state like refers to a whole load of institutions and instruments um, that have the power to improve, um, to kind of impose punitive sanctions. Um, so not just the criminal justice system, um, but also things like immigration detention centers or family courts or civil courts. Um, these institutions that have the power to impose punishments in the, sec the sense that they can legally stipulate how people live and impose the threat of incarceration uh, for failure to comply. Um, and so kind of carceral spaces are all of these places that are imbued with this legal authority to impose sanctions. Um, so wait, what was my other term? Uh, livelihood. And so, you know, livelihood, that's just uh, an anthropologist word, if you like, um, for how people live, including the startling observation that people um, live and work and uh, they don't just live or just work. It, it sounds kind of obvious. Um, but anyway, this construct kind of carceral livelihoods, basically it's getting at the kind of improvised ways of living and working that are devised or made in these carceral spaces. And this might seem super abstract, um, so don't worry, I'm, I'm gonna elaborate on this further in the rest of the talk. Um, okay, so I'm gonna say a bit more about what therapeutic communities in Puerto Rico are actually like. Um, I know they exist in many places, including in New York. Um, so in Puerto Rico, they're sometimes referred to as hogares, um, which means homes. I've also heard them referred to as addiction shelters, um, sometimes street ministries. And these are mostly run by people who have themselves passed through these programs. They tend um, not to employ professionally accredited staff members. They're nearly all nonprofit organizations. Um, they're usually home to somewhere between 20 and 40 residents um, who will live full time at these centers. And their program duration in Puerto Rico is pretty long. Um, so residents will typically live there for about 18 months to two years. That's generally considered to be like um, a treatment duration period, which we can talk a bit more about. Um, and also many residents actually choose to stay put at these places for much longer periods. Um, you know, after this kind of fixed uh, program duration has ended. Um, you can kind of see in these photos here, the one on the top right is um, Puerto Rico's first ever therapeutic community. It's an organization called Hoga Crea, um, which stands for the Home for the Reeducation of Addicts. I'll be talking a lot more about that. And it kind of, uh, it started in about 1968 in a kind of old farmhouse. Um, just below it um, on the bottom right is an organization that I spent a few months working at, which I'll come back to. And the rather beautiful photo I think on the bottom left was um, not taken by me, that's from 1972. And you can see there that that is kind of a, a drug rehabilitation center that has taken up shop in a kind of abandoned Pentecostal church that's crumbling. Um, and so you can see that they kind of occupy these various spaces. Um, so in terms of their methods today, um, therapeutic communities are centered on encounter groups. Um, there's probably a bigger emphasis on prayer and Christianity in Puerto Rico than maybe in other places. Um, and they also rely heavily on this thing called labor therapy, which I'll be talking about. Um, one other thing is that unlike in other parts of Latin America, where it's more common for these mutual aid or peer-based care systems to operate um, without a license, um, 
or without necessarily being officially registered. Um, in Puerto Rico, these organizations do tend to be licensed and recognized by the Commonwealth government as kind of official providers of what they call residential drug treatment. And a lot of these organizations also have contracts with the Department of Corrections and other criminal justice government bodies um, who pay these centers a daily allowance for each resident they take, um, generally as an alternative to prison. Okay, so kind of who are the people who end up here? Um, most of these organizations are operated by men and cater to men. And there are only a couple for women. Um, and this is mostly because of their close relationship with criminal justice. Um, most of the men who wind up in these centers have enrolled under some kind of court order. So under legal pressure from a judge, uh, often because of a drug charge um, and, you know, via criminal court, um, but sometimes through a civil commitment order. Um, and so this might happen if a family member has appealed to a civil court to compel their relative to enter treatment. And so in Puerto Rico, this can happen through one of two laws, um, 408, 67, um, doesn't really matter for this, um, but Basically, for men who have um, enrolled under court order, um, a kind of failure to do so, or if they leave, they could be incarcerated. And this isn't an empty threat. It certainly does happen. Um, but one thing to note is that many residents do choose to stay on and work in these centers after the court order is uh, ended. So that kind of means that within any given organization, at any given time, there'll be people who are under court order and people who aren't. And so some residents could leave in theory if they wanted to. Um, okay, so what happens in these organizations on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, well, the practices that I observed centered first and foremost on this thing called work therapy or labor therapy. Um, a lot of these organizations place a very strong emphasis on curating something that looks like a very hard day's work um, through doing lots of chores, lots of tasks, lots of cooking, lots of cleaning and laundry, um, often building things, sometimes construction. And there's a kind of a sort of real moral and emphasis on keeping busy all the time and on manifesting regular work patterns um, through things like getting up early at 6 a.m., adhering to a very strict daily schedule. Um, some therapeutic communities also send their residents to work off site. So sometimes government departments and private sector businesses will actually contract therapeutic communities to hire residents um, to perform various kinds of unpaid work. Um, so that means that the center will get some money and the resident will get um, either nothing or something very small. And these things are things like picking up trash from town squares um, on behalf of city governments, um, de-weeding waterways for the aqueduct department. Um, I know that during the Zika outbreak in 2016, um, some of these organizations actually dispatched their residents to help with removing thousands of old tires, um, like from residential areas. And that was part of the state's public health response to Zika virus um, because the mosquitoes live in the tires. And th this kind of offsite unpaid work really concerns a lot of people. Um, and needless to say, you know, this whole notion of labor therapy has, you know, few fans in the treatment activist world, um, very um, understandably. Um, so they have this hierarchical structure. This is the slide from earlier. Um, and it resembles a kind of vocational career progression. So when you enter the program, you'll probably be referred to as an addict or an interno or an internado, maybe a participant. Um, and over the course of one or two years, um, there is this process sometimes referred to as re-education or learning and adaptation. And on program completion, which generally takes two years, um, you can graduate and assume this title as a certified re-educated ex-addict. And so this terminology of a re-educated person or a re-educated addict, you know, it has its, its roots in the idea that addiction is a character disorder, and that through hard work, you can somehow rebuild a person, or reconstruct or change their personality. And in the book, I kind of look at the historical roots of this idea. But for now, I just want to flag that this term reeducado is, is also in some respect a labor position. In the sense that at graduation, many organizations will give you a certificate and you'll often hear people talk about how they got certified in addiction at such and such a program.
And so in some sense, um, this certification system is informal. Um, you know, these, this isn't a, um, a credential that is recognized by a medical professional body. You know, they're not um, like the kind of New York peer specialist certification board, um, you know, which is tethered to an official syllabus or training. What it basically means if you, is you've been through this program. But that said, the corrections department and various other state actors do have a habit of recognizing these qualifications when it suits them, um, which I'll be talking about more. Um, okay, so I just wanna talk a little bit about the spaces they kind of can crop up in. So in Puerto Rico, I've seen them in private apartments, gated housing developments, old farmhouses, abandoned churches, decommissioned fire station and abandoned schools. And these structures are sometimes donated to these organizations by the government if they have an empty building. Um, when I did field work, it was exceptionally easy to get a license or to register as a residential drug treatment center. And there's an interesting backstory, um, which uh, an anthropologist called Helena Hansen, who um, may or maybe not, not be listening and who you probably know, um, has written all about. Um, but long story short, um, when I did make my field work, um, the only hard rule if you wanted to set up your own program and get a license was that your building had to meet some basic safety and fire occup um, occupation regulations. So these organizations are often getting set up in, you know, structures designed for all kinds of purposes. Um, and like some of them are really just indistinguishable from like a private house. So last time I was in San Juan in an Airbnb, it turned out that that used to be a therapeutic community. Um, so just in terms of methods, um, there are between 130 and 140 of these organizations. It goes up and down each year. Um, for my research, I visited 15 of them and I interviewed their directors and did short term observations with residents. Um, the organizations vary in their size, their funding structure, their religious orientation. About a third of them are Pentecostal um, and kind of registered as faith-based and the rest are kind of registered as community-based. Um, but this faith-based community-based distinction doesn't tell you very much because most of them can't really be described as secular. Um, a lot of them are steeped in Christianity and Christian teachings. Um, and so I kind of, I went to 15 of these different centers, but I focused for eight months of more intensive participant observation at one program um, that I'm calling La Casita. And during these months, I was kind of on site about five days a week, um, quite long days. Um, and so that was a big part of the study. And I also interviewed um, police and judges and clinicians, but also outreach workers, activists, um, and policy people. Um, I'm going to give you a little whizzing tour of kind of the historical context in which these take place, um, take root in Puerto Rico. Um, just to talk a little bit about Puerto Rico's colonial status and the significance of that for thinking about its carceral turn. So, Puerto Rico's status as kind of an unincorporated territory since 1901 and a commonwealth since 1952 mean that it has this really ambiguous field of sovereignty. Um, as you will probably know, it remains subject to federal legislation at the discretion of Congress and federal government remains in control of most of its state affairs, including citizenship and immigration and customs and other things. Um, Puerto Rico didn't actually gain jurisdiction over narcotics control until 1959, which was seven years after it became a commonwealth. And so prior to this, narcotics control had been administered by the federal government, with drug offenders tried in federal courts, and those found guilty were actually referred to prisons or hospitals on the mainland. So if any of you maybe have heard of the federal hospital known as the Narco Farm, um, this operated in Kentucky um, and opened in 35, this would have been one place that Puerto Rico used to send its drug offenders. Um, but in 1959, um, it became kind of legally responsible for narcotics control. And this, this legal change happened basically without any enabling legislation to expand prison infrastructure. And so prison overcrowding immediately became this problem. So at that time, late 50s, early 60s, um, Puerto Rico actually only had one prison. It was called La Princesa and it was built by the Spanish in old San Juan. 
And although Puerto Rico has built many more prisons since 1959, the important thing to remember is that expansion really hasn't kept a pace with criminal convictions. And so prison overcrowding has just been this major issue in Puerto Rico for several decades. Um, in terms of some context, um, by 2000, Puerto Rico had the third highest incarceration rate in the world, um, surpassed only by mainland United States and Russia. I think that was at about 582 out of 100,000 uh, residents. Um, and so one thing that's relevant for understanding, uh, you know, where these organizations come from, why they've thrived um, in the last, you know, 50 years, and by thrived, I mean um, proliferated, um, among the kind of interesting particularities that distinguish Puerto Rico's carceral turn from that on the mainland, is this pivotal role that self-help therapeutic communities came to play very early on in absorbing drug offenders um, when there was no space in the prisons. So in the literature on incarceration, there's a kind of fancy social science term for this. It's called the informalization of prison governance or sometimes the informalization of containment. Um, but this basically refers to a process whereby governments, um, often in Latin America, uh, implement these US style criminal justice policies that accelerate criminal convictions without having the resources to invest in prison infrastructures. And so, for example, in Guatemala, there's this anthropologist called Kevin O'Neill, and he's looked at how kind of murder convictions that were rushed through after its civil war under intense international um, pressure and supervision basically meant that prisoners had to be placed in these kind of old farms, abandoned military bases, police stations. Um, another example um, comes from Brazil, written by an anthropologist called Chris Garces. And he's basically shown how a lack of resources in Brazil, some of Brazil's prisons can lead to a situation where kind of the work of enforcing order is delegated onto prisoners themselves, who are sometimes kind of recruited to work as prison guards owing to a lack of resources for employing and uh, protecting professional guards. And so I think in Puerto Rico, we have a not so dissimilar process um, of informalization um, that can be seen in its kind of repurposing of therapeutic communities into kind of surrogate prisons or containment facilities um, where it's not uncommon for corrections responsibilities so things like administering urine tests writing case reports even representing clients in court um, it's not uncommon for these things to be performed by residents who are themselves still under court order um, and so, you know, I think that this idea of uh, informality uh, is important here. Um, but what I'm going to talk about maybe a bit more in the rest of the talk is not just their role as a kind of extension of uh, an over full prison system, but also the role they play in kind of generating um, legal job opportunities or working as kind of surrogate livelihoods. Um, sorry, I have to turn my page. Um, all right, um, so something I do in the historical part of the, the, the book is to look at the emergence of these organizations in the aftermath of industrialization. And I'm gonna shelve a lot of that history for now, though for anybody who um, might be interested, um, there's an article I've written about that that's out in circulation and I can easily share that with you. Um, since you've kind of covered a lot of empirical ground, I'm gonna just slow down a bit now and delve into one chapter, which hopefully will just shed a bit more light on what it's like to live and to try to build a life in one of these institutions as a career reeducado. Uh, I'm gonna look a bit more closely at kind of what this kind of work means to these men. And so this is from an abridged section of a chapter um, called Drug Convictions and Becoming an Adjunct. Um, I'm just going to read for a little bit. Um, okay. So, like many reeducados, Salvador describes himself as a product of the criminal justice system. This was a reference to the fact that his arrival at La Casita was precipitated by a drug charge and his first four years there were spent under court order. In terms of education, Salvador had completed fifth grade in high school in a suburb in Bayamon. At 18, he worked as a cashier in a fast food restaurant. Later, he served as a janitor in a large apartment complex. 
He also dealt cocaine on and off. And between 75 and 85, he acquired seven drug-related charges and spent a total of six years in prison. In 85, he was diverted to a therapeutic community. Four years later, when he completed his court order, he graduated and became a certified and re-educated ex-addict. Looking back, he attributes his life trajectory since then directly to his court order. Before this, he said, I hadn't done a thing with my life, not a thing. When I first enrolled in 85, all I knew was drugs in the street. But soon, I was noticed as a good leader. And the program, it helped me to discover talents in me that I never knew I possessed. So after I got certified at my old program, I decided to stay. And after a few years, I followed my dreams and started my own program. And thanks to God, I'm still here today as the founder and director of a therapeutic community, 16 years in counting. Me, a director, he said, even though I don't have sixth grade. So um, what I look at in kind of this part of the book is how many men like Salvador, um, that if you look at their work histories, they kind of, they often span um, the drug economy and also low wage sectors of the legal economy. So kind of prior to acquiring any kind of drug offense, um, these men have often had other low wage legal jobs doing things like cooking and cleaning and restaurants, um, doing fast food delivery for takeaways. Um, quite a few of them had also worked in the military at some point. And the kind of the most common event that led them to enroll um, in therapeutic communities was a criminal justice based court order. Um, so a lot of these men, um, will have substance use problems and what is interesting is that uh, a lot of them a significant proportion of them actually probably wouldn't meet a diagnostic criteria for a substance use disorder so you're kind of having regardless of what your health problem is um, by virtue of passing through the criminal justice system you're sent to a program which it, so it doesn't mean necessarily that you have a substance use disorder for which you feel that you you know might actually need treatment um and so another thing that stood out when i started looking at rey ducado's work experience over time it was kind of how this transition from being a resident to a staff member or from an internado to a reeducado, um, often began while residents were still themselves under court order. Um, so for example, Salvador, um, he'd been court ordered for a minimum of four years, um, or when he was court ordered for four years, he was actually appointed as a tribunal coordinator after just one year, and as an assistant director after two years, and finally as a director of his program after four years. Um, there was another guy, Hector, um, he was appointed as a caseworker after 18 months. That was actually two and a half years prior to completing his compulsory treatment order. Um, and so these positions of responsibility, they come with a variety of labor arrangements. Um, some reeducados who choose to stay on after graduating, um, they just receive free room and board. Um, they don't get paid anything, um, but they also don't have to pay a residence fee, um, which by the way, varies usually from about 200 to $400 a month. Um, but generally the men themselves wouldn't pay this. This would generally be paid by the corrections department. Um, so these more kind of junior positions might involve doing things like guiding new recruits, supervising and facilitating activities, taking messages on the office phone. And the men doing this kind of unpaid work sometimes refer to themselves as volunteers. Um, so uh, kind of one level, sorry, uh, one level up above um, these kind of completely unpaid positions, uh, people who've been there a bit longer um, uh, usually say that they're staff rather than volunteers. And they will sometimes receive um, a sub minimum wage stipend um, or maybe a minimum wage stipend, but rarely um, in addition to free room and board. And so that sub minimum wage stipend really varies. It could be a few hundred dollars a month. Um, and these men are often have titles such as caseworker or social worker or therapist or case manager. And they're responsible, you know, for kind of doing the, the bread and butter of these organizations. They're, um, they're leading group therapies, um, they're mentoring recruits, um, they're also enforcing order. Um, and they also, these men are performing a range of criminal justice based responsibilities. So they're doing things like 
um, going with residents to hearings, sometimes representing them, um, administering urine tests, and sometimes even writing case reports, um, which will come back to this. And so, so at the top of those organizations are the directors and leaders who usually um, receive a formal salary paid into a bank account and usually live off site. Um, so just as an example of this, uh, one guy, Carlos, he's like 42 years old and he was the director of a therapeutic community in Guayama. And he gets about $22,000 via a government corrections grant um, and lives off site in a privately owned house. Um, that said, not all directors were this well paid. Um, some were actually barely better off financially than the residents. Um, I interviewed one guy, he was 72 and the director of, um, of another program. And uh, this one was evangelical and he'd had this position for uh, over 20 years, but he'd actually um, always just survived on a kind of sub minimum wage stipend, um, something that he received through the church. And he didn't rent or own his own home as well. He kind of lived nearby in the private lodgings that was owned by the church. Um, and so in trying to make sense of these kind of labor arrangements, these ways of working, I've come to think about this in, as a form of carceral adjuncting. And I think by this, I'm talking about labor positions that exist or are invented in these carceral spaces and that can also be recognized as kind of cost cutting devices on the part of the carceral state. So these positions are not secure wage labor positions. They have a certain informality to them. They're low cost, they're losable. Um, the men doing this work are not really paid or not paid a, a, you know, a real salary. And so in calling this work adjuncting, what I'm trying to emphasize is that these men are kind of undertaking a lot of work on behalf of the carceral state that you know, would ordinarily um, be performed by paid professionals. Um, you know, they're being tasked with supervising drug offenders. Um, this often, as we've seen, means supervising each other. Um, they're ensuring residents make it to court hearings. Um, they're also performing roles as legal representatives. So I frequently observed court hearings where these men did not always have lawyers and were instead left to kind of represent each other in court. Um, so yeah, my take on this is that it's a kind of form of adjuncting. And so a carceral adjunct is basically a low cost worker who has been converted um, through these improvised vocational structures from a kind of criminalized position as an offender who the state is financially responsible for into this kind of inexpensive agent or worker within the carceral state. Um, and one thing I explore in the chapter is how we can start to see this kind of surprising alignment of interests in the sense that what Reeducados want um, is a job and a way to make a living and a way to build a life and a career for themselves. And what the state really wants is to substantially lower incarceration costs. And so what has emerged in Puerto Rico is a legal environment where men who have been criminalized um, can be repackaged and kind of catapulted into these adjunct positions as tribal coordinators, as caseworkers, as therapists, and essentially kind of left to their own devices to figure out how best to operate these programs and more fundamentally how best to take care of each other. And you know, the people who are jumping at the chance to take these adjunct positions, they tend to be men from the low waged and insecure ends of the formal economy. Um, men who have also been involved in the drug economy and who are now in some sense kind of dealing with the stigma of a criminal mark. And, and you know, even when these men do leave, I think, you know, many of them are going to face significant barriers to obtaining alternative kinds of employment. Um, and so the main argument I make in this chapter is it's this kind of alliance of interests between Reeducados desires for jobs and opportunities and the state's interest in keeping down containment costs that's proven kind of exceptionally effective in producing and sustaining these carceral livelihoods. And so this is kind of one of the key reasons uh, why these institutions have been so prolific and durable in Puerto Rico. Um, and so right now, I don't know how I'm doing for time. Um, I'm gonna think I'm gonna talk for about 10 more minutes, but feel free to interrupt me if that's too long. Um, it's always hard to kind of cram a whole book into your presentation. Um, so rather than cram, 
I'm just going to share another part of, um, of the book. And it's a scene that I just wanted to share with you. It kind of, it looks more closely at the improvised educational channels that these organizations operate. And I think that what they help to illustrate are the kind of quite creative ways that reeducados are working to build livelihoods out of the various materials that are available to them. Um, so this is from kind of a part of the book called uh, Practicum. Many therapeutic communities operate internal training schemes known as apprenticeships or la practica for reeducados. These trainings confer internally recognized forms of accreditation, but they vary in content from place to place and they tend not to follow any specified curriculum, at least not one that I could find written down. In 2017, I attended six training sessions for reeducados at two different communities. I found myself watching Manuel, a long-standing and evidently much beloved director of a residential program in Guayama. His official title was district training official and he was responsible for coordinating and delivering trainings across several programs. In a previous life, Manuel had been a shop assistant and then a drug trafficker, but in 1991, he'd been court mandated to a residential program, the same one where we were all now gathered, and he'd stayed there ever since. I watched Manuel teach four classes. He was charismatic and often paced up and down the room as he talked. He always wore a suit and tie and would start each session by inviting the group to hold hands in prayer. Being here together, he'd say, professionals among professionals, this is what we strive for. We are happy, we are motivated, we are grateful. Gracias a Dios. So in format, practicums felt like unusually lively seminars. Um, between 10 and 15 people would attend, there'd be worksheets and refreshments, and a facilitator would introduce a topic and then for the next few hours we'd listen to a lecture, complete some exercises and watch online videos. And in terms of content, they were a kind of eclectic hodgepodge of lessons. Some were based on public health um, research. There was one on the effects of trauma and one on comorbidity. Others were based on more kind of pop science stuff. Um, you know, those self-help books that tell you how you can succeed in business. One session was called Achieving Your Potential and another was called Dealing with Stress. Um, so others were kind of more Christian or Bible-based. Some had thoughts for the day, like the power of prayer or the meaning of sacrifice. Um, and so I'm gonna do a kind of dive just into one session I attended that maybe people at Drug Policy Alliance um, just might find interesting. Um, the talk was called Substance Use Disorder and DSM-5. And it was basically devised to kind of bring reeducados up to speed um, with the latest perspectives in public health and addiction science. Um, I'll just read now really briefly. So Manuel began the session by reminding attendees that addiction was just a lay term and that as professionals talking among professionals, we should all be trying to use the correct DSM-5 term, substance use disorder. Before beginning his presentation, Manuel asked the class if we could name any characteristics that someone with a substance use disorder might display. I looked around as hands went flying up. Being manipulative, one guy said. Conflict with authority, said another. Manuel wrote down the Rea Ducados responses on the board. After 10 minutes or so, our group definition of addiction was scribbled in marker pen all over the whiteboard. The characteristics that somebody with a substance use disorder might display, it had been agreed, were manipulation, aggressiveness, irritability, conflict with authority, loss of one's character, and a loss of social values. Manuel then turned to his next slide. It listed the DSM-5 criteria. We gazed up to take in the information. It was quite different to the initial offering. These were 11 observable reportable symptoms. They included consuming more substances than originally intended, continued use in spite of harm to personal relationships, spending large amounts of time consuming or obtaining substances, development of withdrawal symptoms, and so the list went on. After the presentation, there was a lively debate about what addiction was, what a substance use disorder was, and whether they might mean the same thing. Not everybody agreed, but despite a partial lack of consensus, nobody was bored. And by the end of the two hour session, nearly everybody was able to name, when tested, the 11 observable symptoms of a substance use disorder. As Manuel brought the session to an end, he gave an off-the-cuff keynote 
Today's addicts are complicated, he said. It's not like before, when we addicts were just addicts. Now they have trauma, mental health, dual diagnosis. Addicts have changed, he said, and we have to change too. Um, I'm just gonna pause there and just say that, I think to me these training sessions in general, um, and this one in particular, um, stood out as a kind of striking dramatization of the improvised ways that these men are trying to professionalize themselves. Sure, um, there's no official syllabus, but what is happening here um, is something that I analyze as, um, I call it vernacular professionalization. But essentially, I'm talking about uh, ways in which people kind of try to educate themselves that essentially draw not one body of theory, but on whatever is around and whatever um, people have access to, kind of blending these different kinds of knowledge, you know, from pop science um, to public health, uh, to Christianity, um, but blending all of these materials that are available into something that these men can use and appropriate and put together to build an improvised education system that can offer some kind of career progression. And so a play in that encounter was this kind of encounter, uh, in, in that session was this encounter between what well, looks like some two pretty different perspectives, um, you know, one being this clinical view of DSM and biomedicine and, and the other being this kind of much more um, character logical way of understanding addiction, um, one that's very embedded in the therapeutic community world. Um, and, you know, to outsiders, see, like myself, you know, these do seem to be really high stakes framing tensions. And, you know, there are policy battles being fought over this at the level of, of, of drug policy and activism. And, and I guess what really struck me here was how the Rey de Gados themselves were kind of quite accommodating of this biomedical way of understanding addiction. They wanted to learn more. Um, they had this very accommodating orientation that suggested to me um, that it was kind of uh, a way in which they were very thirsty for kind of acquiring whatever raw material was around um, that they could piece together into an education system. Um, and so for today's attendees, I'm going to just finish up. Um, attendance was rewarded with small prizes, an embossed certificate for each attendant, a medal for the newcomers, and a plastic shield for Rocky, who had been deemed the day to be the most promising leader. The conferral of these prizes was marked by a round of applause, one for each member, with absent men calling in to deliver their congratulations on loudspeaker. Afterwards, we tucked into the refreshments. There was a large spread of donuts and cakes, and at the end of the session, we prayed. Manuel's energy never dropped. We are so grateful for these opportunities we have been given, he said. Remember to have your certificates in a safe place. That way, if anyone says you aren't qualified, you can show them that you are. After the workshop, I stood outside and chatted to Luis. When I came here, he said, I didn't know at that moment that I was capable of what I was capable of. I didn't know I could professionalize myself. I didn't know I could learn to help others just as I was helped. Um, Okay, I'm just going to wrap up. So kind of where does this leave us? Um, and so kind of, you know, we have these organizations that have uh, have grown and persisted for over half a century. Um, they've flourished and keep kept growing throughout the carceral turn. These are highly durable institutions. And as I've tried to say, I think um, when we think about, you know, why they are so prolific in Puerto Rico, we really need to recognize the roles they are playing in generating um, legal, if not always conventional job opportunities or surrogate uh, livelihoods for criminalized men in Puerto Rico. Um, so as, you know, as treatment institutions, many people will definitely find them wanting. Um, but uh, yeah, in terms of kind of thinking about uh, what happens to these men, and what kind of life are they providing and what can they be said to offer? I think that this is kind of not a really simple question at all. Um, a kind of, you know, I think my sense of this career ladder is that it offers some things and it fails to offer others. Um, and so when I interviewed Rio de Carlos and when we looked back at their life trajectories, one thing that became quite clear was that these vocational structures and graduation systems are really very rarely a one-way ticket. Um, a lot of the men who get certified do actually do so several times um, because when they leave the organization, they maybe pick up another drug charge and maybe get sent back again. 
or sometimes because they break the rules or um, use drugs while they are living and working in the programs. Just as an example here, so there was one guy, Jorge, and by the, I went to his graduation ceremony in 2016, um, but he'd actually already graduated from the same program three times before. Um, so that means he'd spent, you know, 18 months as a full-time resident there three times. And since he'd also chosen to stay at that place after he'd graduated as a volunteer, he'd actually now spent a total of six years living full time at this center. So he's kind of climbed this ladder several times in his life. And each, you know, anytime he's attempted to leave or do something else for various reasons, um, he's unfortunately ended up back in very difficult situations of quite extreme precarity. Um, and it's really quite hard to communicate just kind of how devastating for him that he, he described that experience um, from going um, from being somebody who had a, some kind of position of responsibility and a certain degree of power um, and also kind of respect from other residents um, to essentially kind of being homeless again and being ha having to kind of beg for money at traffic lights. And so my own notes and life histories of dozens of reeducados um, show that they kind of routinely oscillate over many years between a resident and a reeducado position um, with the interim period um, often being one of kind of extreme vulnerability. And so outside these centers, um, these men often find themselves in very difficult circumstances, um, similar to the ones that preceded their enrollment. Um, that said, there were some really notable success stories. Um, so men who kind of retained this job for many years, sometimes decades. Um, and who'd able to, uh, attained a kind of stable salary and were able to live off site. Um, so just kind of summing up, I hope that we can move to the discussion soon um, in terms of like where this leaves us. Um, you know, these organizations are, you know, very poorly equipped to deliver healthcare. Um, I think that is fair. Um, I think that we also need to recognize though that in this context of kind of mass unemployment and carceral expansion, these organizations are now being conscripted into doing the work of kind of multiple other faltering structures. So they're doing the work of containment that the corrections department um, can't afford to do. They're giving, providing surrogate jobs for people when the formal labor, part, labor market isn't providing that. You know, they're meeting men's needs for housing and basic subsistence. Um, in other words, they're kind of performing a whole load of kind of extra therapeutic work that has very little to do with um, treating addiction. Um, and I guess my view here is that this is just sometimes skipped over or perhaps not recognized in uh, a lot of conversations about um, these institutions. Um, yeah, and so I guess it just, uh, in terms of some key messages um, for people who are working in this field, um, and you know, these are still very much evolving, so I really welcome talking about them. Uh, I think the current focus, um, at least in Puerto Rico on treatment activism has kind of been on, you know, these organizations really failing to offer evidence-based treatments for drug addiction. And, you know, um, I think that is correct completely. Um, but what I'm trying to do in carceral livelihoods is to acknowledge that these institutions are also, or maybe can also be considered to be in a different line of work. Um, you know, there are places where men with very few options are devising jobs and careers for themselves. And these efforts are constantly and repeatedly being kind of enlisted by the carceral state, um, you know, because of their interest in bringing down containment costs. Um, so, um, oh, I did have another slide. Oh, no, I didn't. Sorry. Um, yeah, so I kind of think it's just really important that we stop blaming the people who run these centers. Um, you know, they're not profiteers who are deliberately exploiting drug users. Um, they're men with criminal records who you know, face enormous barriers to getting other kinds of jobs and they're doing their best to create uh, some kind of way of getting by uh, with very little in the way of resources or help. Um, so maybe it'll be a good time now to just kind of uh, open up a discussion or um, however, uh, Jules, whoever you want to do this. I don't know if I talk for way too long, I'm sorry. Hi, this is Eliza Cohen from the Drug Policy Alliance. Caroline, thanks so much. Um, you did not talk for way too long. That was great. Okay, um, <laughs> we have a couple questions so far and I would invite anyone else to submit them via the Q&A box. Um, it should be, if you're in full screen mode, it should be in the bottom of your screen and you should just be able to type them. 
Um, you can also send them in the chat box if that doesn't work for you. Um, the first question, Caroline, is what would some possible alter alternatives to these OGARIs be? Assuming they were eventually phased out, what would replace them? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that um, the, the neat substitution um, would not simply be one of um, meeting kind of uh, the needs of these men for um, care or support with, uh, with, with substance use disorders. Um, you know, I think, you know, Puerto Rico does have a lack of evidence-based treatment, but I think what these institutions, if they were to be replaced or, or, or changed, um, what are you going to do about housing? So I think, you know, you're going to still need a need for shelter. And so I think maybe it would please a lot of people to um, kind of specialize their roles a bit. And, you know, maybe some people, maybe it would be better to stop calling these drug treatment centers at all. Maybe um, uh, institute some of them to be actually homeless shelters um, and some of them to be, um, you know, places where people go to get help finding jobs. Um, and also to kind of, you know, find alternative services that can be helpful for people who do need help with, um, with a drug problem, you know, things that can be addressed on an outpatient basis. Um, so I think it's not a simple substitution of replace bad treatment with good treatment. I think it's kind of recognizing, okay, but what about who's going to give a home to these men and who's going to give them a job? Thank you. Um, another question. Why do you think that the residential treatment model in Puerto Rico was so, quote, successful in that it proliferated so immensely, not only in the island, but among the diaspora as well? Um, yeah. Um, so I think that um, to understand why they have proliferated so much, um, you know, from the late 60s until the present, you've really kind of got to understand three things. Um, you know, one is post-industrialism and the kind of failure of um, capitalist development in Puerto Rico to deliver full employment, um, you know, in a context where unemployment and especially male unemployment has been this persistent, chronic, enduring problem. Part of the reason these institutions thrive is that they've kind of taken on this extra job of giving men without work a surrogate job. Um, and I think the other major factor um, giving a lot of institutional support to these organizations, especially at the level of referrals of new people and also at the level of funding, is this intersection that they have um, with the criminal justice system, you know, and that goes right back to, um, you know, the, the carceral turn um, that happens uh, in, uh, and, and, and the war on drugs. So I think um, they're really tied up with these two um, massive structural um, processes. And then I would also say that, you know, amidst this, it is also the actions and the fact that the people who live in these have said like, okay, well, what can I do with this? You know, now that, I, now that I'm living in this place, what am I going to do? What can I make out of it? And so another kind of element to them reproducing and, you know, to these senses establishing new ones is that the men who are in them are seizing whatever opportunities are available to them to try and make something out of their predicament. Um, so, you know, I would say good old structure and agency. Thank you. Um, how are these therapeutic communities affected by Hurricane Maria? And did this change their role in the community? Yeah, um, so that is a really good question. Um, and it's not one that I feel that I've done enough field work to give um, since Maria to like give a really full picture. Um, what I would say um, is that my uh, contacts tell me um, that some of them um, were involved in kind of part, some kinds of kind of recovery community based kind of work, you know, when, when there were loads of trees that needed to be moved out of the streets, you know, in some remote towns, I think, again, we saw this kind of, oh, we have these kind of men who can do this work, you know, for the mayor or whatever. Um, but I can't really, um, uh, yeah, I, a question that I've tried to actually um, do more field work twice um, in the last year. And now there's um, 
coronavirus, so I'm not there. And um, the time before, my visa was denied. Um, so I think it's an important question that I haven't been able to answer yet. Maybe the third time will be the time for you to get there. Um, <laughs> I'd invite anyone to submit any other questions via the Q&A um, box, but I'll also kick it to Jules to see if she has any questions. Uh, first of all, Carolyn, thank you. What a great presentation. It's so nice to um, have work that's acknowledging the, the positive aspects of therape the therapeutic communities and why they're so persistent. Um, one, I guess they sort of two questions. <clears throat> one is, um, I really appreciate this idea that the re-education is allowing them access to uh, employment opportunities that they wouldn't have access to mm -hmm. otherwise. Did you see any instances where those skills translated to any kind of work outside of um, these programs? That's my first question. And then the second question is, I know some other scholars that have looked at TCs in the US have looked at um, the issue of re-education, not just in terms of sort of hard skills or sort of didactic information that people have received, but also sort of the norms and the kind of character that's trying to be instilled by these programs. And I'm wondering if you saw uh, any of that in your in your field work and want to comment on the kinds of re-education that are sort of beyond um, some of the re-employment stuff. Yeah, um, thanks for the question, Jules. Um, and yeah, it's a really important one. Like, I think that uh, in terms of what these kind of credentials that in some ways they like, in some ways they have this quite elaborate kind of um, whole symbolic structure around them. I didn't get to talk about it today, but these graduation events, they're very big. Um, people get certificates. There's a, you know, the, the mayor will be there, the, you know, the police chief will be there. And so, you know, they have this whole kind of symbolic architecture surrounding them. Um, and then one of the things that it kind of really struck me was how they were also very forfeitable. Um, they were not um, uh, necessarily transferable. Um, I didn't um, really see people, for example, transferring from maybe this care setting to another care setting. Um, if men were getting other kinds of work, I think it was very much, um, you know, the kinds of work that they were getting before they entered this system, which as I mentioned, were things like uh, working in fast food restaurants or in, you know, uh, being security guards, things like that. Um, and the other thing was just how forfeitable um, these kind of qualifications were in the sense that, you know, one minute you could have it and be a director and then, um, you know, you put a foot out of line and you can go straight back to the bottom of this pyramid. Um, and so I think that it wasn't necessarily um, it wasn't a currency that carried weight outside of this system, really. Um, you know, it, 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 it got men somewhere within this system, um, but I don't think it, uh, it assisted them in finding employment um, on the outside, you know, which is maybe not, you know, partly the fault of qualification. There also aren't very many jobs for people who have, um, for, for, you know, for, for this demographic. Um, in terms of, uh, I think your other question was about uh, re-education and the kind of uh, the things that are an attempted to achieve in that that are kind of more to do with character um, and kind of moral therapy um, was that uh, your other point yes um, yeah and so I think um, one thing that I found quite striking was how there was this like really strong moral emphasis on working um, and so in terms of like what are the traits that they're trying to inculcate there was this whole kind of um, intense kind of charade sometimes of like just having to um, get up really early and like do your chores on time and follow this kind of strict daily schedule. And there seemed to be a real disconnect between this kind of um, conversation about being a productive person. People were often talking about being a productive citizen or a hardworking citizen. Um, and then not really like any... Um, attention, which, you know, is probably due to lack of resources or understandably, but on kind of vocational training. So it's not like you're being taught about how you find a job or, you know, being helped with your resume or, or you know, or, or things like that. So it, it did seem to be more about kind of inculcating um, a kind of hardworking masculinity and more so than getting a job. 
Thanks. We just had a couple more questions come in. Um, so the first one is, what role does the government play in all of this and where they fall short? Who is providing evidence-based treatment? So I think, you know, in terms of the level of government, um, the kind of the Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services institution known as AMSCA, um, they're really severely um, under-resourced. And so, um, as I said, you know, their role is to kind of um, uh, make sure organizations have a license, um, but they have, you know, very, very little regulatory power, um, both legally, um, because of the way mental health law works in Puerto Rico, but also in terms of kind of labor power. Um, they don't really have the resources in this department to go and, um, you know, ensure that organizations with licenses are adhering to certain standards, even if they were legally permitted. Um, to interfere here. And so I think, uh, you know, since healthcare privatization, which happens in Puerto Rico in the 1990s, you've really seen a kind of um, the, the kind of health department or AMSCA, um, what was, yeah, kind of backing off as thinking of itself as a provider um, of, uh, of services. Um, the government provides very few services. Um, and yeah, there are big gaps um, all over the place. And so I think in a way, there's a kind of, well, given that we can't offer an alternative, um, you know, these are good doing some important work at the moment. And, you know, we would probably be worse off without them. I think our last question is, um, if you know the most common substances used and if you know the incidence of, a, of dual psychiatric diagnoses. Um, no, and I can tell you why, and that is um, one of the things that um, I was really struck by was how few of the people who enter these places have ever received a diagnosis, a formal diagnosis. Um, a lot of people, even those who have been through drug court, um, have never received a clinical assessment. Um, and I found that in my conversations, but there's also kind of evaluations of drug court programs find there's a real lack of documentation of people receiving clinical assessments. Um, you know, when you look at the participant kind of files and official paperwork for people who are in drug court. Um, so given that these organizations, you know, they don't have their own doctors, so they can't do these, in, these things either. So you have a real lack of epidemiological data to kind of say, accurately what the, you know, the medical needs um, of this population would be. And my sense is that many of these men, not all, you know, that not all of these men have substance use disorders. Um, and so in terms of the other question, um, I can only kind of answer this based on kind of anecdote, but uh, I would say that among the people who, you know, did feel that they had drug problems, you know, disregarding whatever the diagnosis was, um, my sense, uh, my sense was heroin was the major one, um, which is not to say that heroin was more common than, um, you know, marijuana use or co cocaine use. It's just to say that uh, people don't necessarily enroll in these organizations because they're seeking care for a health problem. Great, thank you. I don't think we have any um, final questions. So I just um, want to say thank you to everyone for joining and um, thank you especially um, to you, Caroline, for um, adapting and making this into a webinar and for your great presentation. Um, just a reminder to everyone, we have our next Drug Researchers Roundtable um, on April 30th at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. Um, Dr. Calvin John Smiley will be presenting on the topic of reentry. And we'll start promoting that soon. Um, if you'd like to, if you're not on our listserv and you'd like to be a part of it, or if you'd like to um, stay up to date about our other events, you can follow us on Twitter at Drug Policy Nerds, or you can email me, Aliza Cohen, that's A Cohen, C O H E N, at drugpolicy.org um, to be added to our listserv where we send out newsletters and event reminders. Um, so, Thanks to everyone and hope you all take care of yourselves and take care of your communities. Thank you.